panel in our research colloquium series for this year. Uh, my name is Nancy Van Stuyvendel. I am the Associate Dean Research in the Faculty of Native Studies. Uh, and it is one of the great uh, pleasures of my role to be able to organize uh, this research, research colloquium series. Uh, this year, of course, we're doing things a little bit differently. Usually we have research day uh, in one day and we all have the opportunity to gather together uh, share share food, share some uh, conversation and, and laughter. Unfortunately, we don't we aren't able to do that today, but uh, this is the, the next best thing. Uh, and so we're splitting up research day over three Fridays in November, this uh, today, of course, and then also November 20th and November 20, uh, 27th. And I will have more information for you on those events uh, at the end of this. So yes, our research colloquium series is entitled Engaging Relations. Uh, we begin by acknowledging, of course, that the Faculty of Native Studies is located in Treaty 6 territory and the Métis homeland. Uh, and we're delighted today to be able to showcase the research of our new PhD students in the Faculty of Native Studies. So this is the fourth, yes, and you can see them there. Uh, or maybe you can, or maybe you can only see me, but I can see them. <laughs> um, uh, yes, our, our new uh, PhD students. This is the fourth cohort of students in our PhD program in the Faculty of Native Studies, which began in 2017. Uh, so we're, we're super stoked to be growing our program and to have these fantastic scholars uh, growing, it, growing it for us. Um, new scholars, of course, bring really exciting and cutting edge research questions and theoretical frameworks and methodological approaches to the discipline of Indigenous studies, uh, and they are doing the work of, of building, the hard and brilliant work of building this discipline. So it's always super exciting to get to hear from new researchers. Uh, so today we're excited to hear from Elaine Alexi, Amanda Evans, Leah Hertzun, and Wyatt Schiefel, Schiefelbein. Yes, thank you, Wyatt. Uh, so a few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, I think everyone has their video off, but please leave your video off and mute yourself for the audience members. Uh, each presenter will have 20 minutes to present. I will introduce each presenter before they present, and then we are holding questions until the end of all four presentations. Uh, at any time, however, feel free to send me your questions for the presenters in the chat, uh, and please do that as a private message to me. So uh, I should come up as the host. And again, my name is Nancy Van Stuyvendel. Uh, please send the messages to me. And then at the end, I will be uh, asking your questions to the presenters. Also just note that the presentations are being recorded for posting on our website. So we have an archive of this wonderful event. Uh, audience members will not be recorded and the Q&A session will not be recorded. Uh, and then finally, uh, I was saying this as people were, were joining before, so apologies if this is a repetition, but I have put in the chat the link to our research achievements poster for the Faculty of Native Studies for this year, 2019 to 2012. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, research assistant Amanda Barlow for uh, putting together the posters for me. She, she saved my butt in doing that. Uh, unfortunately, the, all of the citation information, sorry for the, for, all the academics amongst us, all of the citation information is not available on those posters because they're small and we can't uh, put everything there. So it's easily viewable on your, on your computer screens. We are working on a larger poster that we will have in the faculty uh, and that we will post in the faculty once we're able to come back to campus. Okay, so I think that's it for housekeeping items. And perfect timing, we're gonna start with uh, Elaine Alexi. Elaine is a member of the Tetlet Gwich'in First Nation and was born and raised in her home community of Fort McPherson, Northwest Territories. She loves to spend time on her ancestral lands with family in the Northwest Territories and Yukon, and beading has been an empowering art form for her. A first year FNS PhD student, she has been researching Gwich'in material culture since 2013 and shares her work through her blog and Instagram under the name Shinli Mintai, which means strong hands. The title of her presentation is Visiting with Our Ancestors, 
which in material culture, museum research and relationality. So I will turn it over to you, Elaine. Thank you, Nancy. Um, can everybody see my screen? Hey, does it look good, Nancy? Okay. So uh, to begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today to you from the traditional territory of Treaty 6 lands and homelands of the Métis Nation. Thank you to the Faculty of Native Studies for the opportunity to share my PhD research project. I appreciate having the space to do so. I want to send a special welcome to my family and friends joining in today from the Northwest Territories, the Yukon, Alaska, and elsewhere. I appreciate all of you being here. Dringwinzi shalakat ilena laksi vilji tatlija quits at ikli shugu shugu yu an Robert and Dorothy Alexi. Good day, my friends. My name is Elaine Alexi, and I am a member of Tetlikwitchin First Nation, born and raised in the Northwest Territories. My parents are Robert and Dorothy Alexi. Today, I'm going to share a short presentation on my PhD research, which I've entitled Visiting with Our Ancestors, Quichin Material Culture, Museum Research, and Relationality. To begin, it is, it is important for me to share who I am as a Teleguichin woman to provide context and to situate myself on the topic and approach to my research project. I come from a Teleguichin family made up of storytellers, hunters, high tanners, sewers, and makers. The photo on the left is my great grandmother, Della Alexi, one of the matriarchs of my large family. The photo to the right is me at eight years old at our spring hunting camp along Tetlikwinichik, the Peel River. I spent a great majority of my childhood at places like our family hunting camps, learning our cultural land-based practices and being out in my ancestral homelands. These are the best childhood memories. Aside from being a PhD student, I am also an artist. I practice beadwork and other sewing traditions passed down to me within my family. I will share with you a few images that have been vital to the development of my research area. In 2013, I started researching on Gwich'in material culture. This includes analyzing beadwork traditions, visiting museum collections, as this photo was taken of me at the British Museum in London, England, and recreating important Gwich'in art pieces. In the photos here, I use glass beads, hides, artificial sinew or bone, just to name a few of the, my materials that I use. Through museum, through museum work, I have traced family connections to pieces of Gwich'in material culture. The photo of the Gwich'in style wraparound shoe on the left is described as Kwan Sakai Chi, shoes you wear around the fire. From my experience in looking at museum pieces, it, it is very uncommon to learn the maker or who owned the piece because of its age, a lack of documentation, or because nobody cared to record it. The shoes belong to my great grandmother, who I shared a photo earlier in the presentation, her brother, Richard Martin. It is, and, it, and currently it is in the collection at the Yale Peabody Museum in New Haven, Connecticut. This has been an important discovery for my family and for me as a Tetlikwitchin artist. On the right is a photo of a fully beaded velvet bag that is approximately about 70 years old, and it is made by the late Gwich'in uh, elder Elizabeth Kinesi, who I fondly remember. The beadwork is, an, is of an old style, and in some areas this type of beadwork tradition is no longer being practiced. My mother Dorothy owns this bag and I've always admired it growing up when I saw her using it. One day I decided to take a deeper look into this beadwork tradition to learn of the distinctive floral designs and motifs and try to recreate a bag similar to it. I beaded this piece with the help of my mom Dorothy and my sister Shirley. They both assisted me in sewing the bag together. 
The process of learning the beadwork tradition and motifs in conversation with my mother, an expert sewer herself, memories of old style beading were shared and in my mind came to life. Without the involvement of my family members, the construction of the bag would not have been possible. Guidance from my mother, a Gwich'in knowledge holder, was instrumental in its design and creation. Her insight helped me and my sister to think of Gwich'in beading forms and sewing in new ways, guided with purpose by an old design. In a sense, this was an important moment in my understanding of Gwich'in material culture through community-engaged research. By embodying knowledge through my culture and relearning skills with family was an important process for me in the construction of my Gwich'in beaded bag from start to completion. So the process of creating a Gwich'in beaded bag provided me with the understanding that our Gwich'in beaders and sewers made beautiful things to represent the deep love that they had for their families. They made beautiful pieces for the people they loved and each piece tells a unique story of time, place, and kinship connections. Gwich'in beadwork traditions capture our connections to land and love of culture as part of dis displaying our visual identity and our sovereignty. This involves incredible craftsmanship using many mediums and forms. So this research on my people's material culture has been very uplifting. Together, my early, my early museum research with my beadwork and sewing experiences have really shaped my thinking about the importance of Gwich'in material culture, particularly our beadwork traditions. This leads me to research to my research question, how are Gwich'in beadwork traditions relevant to identity and how, do, how we express ourselves as Gwich'in people? This question has prepared me to think about developing my doctoral research. Um, sorry, uh, this question has prepared me to think about developing my doctoral research project to look deeper into the role that Gwich'in beadwork has for Gwich'in people. With a focus on cultural resurgence, I propose to examine historical Gwich'in beadwork traditions in museum collections and understandings of relationality within these spaces. So my PhD research week will examine how Gwich'in beadwork traditions shape Gwich'in identity by exploring the cultural connections to historical beadwork pieces in museum collections with Gwich'in elders, knowledge holders, and practicing artists. By centering a Gwich'in worldview, my research will bridge the past into the present through, through knowledge mobilization on material culture. And I propose to do this in two ways. First, by examining historic Gwich'in beadwork pieces in a museum with Gwich'in community participants. And second, by working closely with Gwich'in elders and knowledge holders who have extensive understanding of Gwich'in material culture. By visiting museum collections and documenting the historical and living knowledges of Gwich'in material culture, I will document and revitalize Gwich'in material culture knowledge and practice. I will focus on how Gwich'in beading has transformed over time and explore how museums can provide space for knowledge reclamation, for healing, and resurgence of Gwich'in art artistic traditions through the, their preservation of older be beading materials and styles. Reconnecting Indigenous communities with their cultural heritage in museum collections strengthens cultural ties, it promotes healing and has a positive impact on community identity. With this in mind, my research seeks to position Gwich'in material culture as part of our collective identity and community well being. Reuniting Gwich'in community participants with beadwork pieces held in museum collections at institutions like the Royal Alberta Museum and the Canadian Museum of History, to name a few. So, through this study, I will provide a more in depth understanding on the role. Of his uh, on the role of historic Gwich'in theater traditions in contemporary Gwich'in identity and sharing the storied narratives that emerge from this process with community participants. So my theoretical framework, 
I will use resurgence and relationality from a critical Indigenous theory lens that centers a Gwich'in worldview. Indigenous resurgence and relationality will be my theoretical frameworks that I will use in my analysis. I will analyze settler colonialism and a dispossession of the Indigenous other, the role of museums as contested spaces for Indigenous peoples and explore ways that Indigenous cultural resurgence concepts are embodied through the knowledge production of Gwich'in material culture. My research will explore how material culture is important for the construction of Gwich'in identity and how it contributes to cultural wellness. Through our relationality framework, I will position Indigenous cultural expressions through the production of Indigenous material culture as constructive for the formation of cultural identity and demonstrate how it is also inherently connected to family, community, and our relationship to land. Part of this important process is prioritizing research participants, family stories and practices of Gwich'in material culture creation. By using an Indigenous resurgence framework, this paper, this project will contribute to the growing scholarship and to position a Gwich'in understanding on the importance of beadwork traditions for cultural wellness and continuity. By creating a Gwich'in resurgence theory, I will be able to showcase the immense knowledge and expertise that is drawn from Gwich'in material culture drawn from material culture research and to deepen connections for community perspectives with their ancestral material culture pieces that are stored in museum collections. A focus on res resurgence will draw on Indigenous knowledge and contribute to museum collections in a way that fosters repatriation and relationship building grounded in material culture practices. Indigenous resurgence will be the site where Indigenous knowledge will be grounded through the practice of embodied knowledge production within Indigenous beadwork traditions, a form of Indigenous material culture. So my application, how I'm going to apply this uh, from the position of building an Indigenous resurgence framework, I applied within two interrelated theoretical areas, a post-colonial theory and museum theory. Um, within post-colonial theory, I will analyze the construction of Western colonial narratives of the Indigenous other and other social objects. I will examine how colonialism has impacted the way Indigenous peoples and their cultures are perceived within settler societies, but also how these narratives reduce Indigenous material culture pieces as in an inanimate. Through an Indigenous resurgence framework, I will counter the colonial narratives by presenting Indigenous worldviews of the significance of their material culture protection, pr production for cultural identity. Museums present a complex web of relations for Indigenous peoples to navigate, especially considering their role in disconnecting Indigenous peoples from their cultural heritage, in turn impacting wellness and sense of collective identity. Applying a resurgence framework to museum theory can demonstrate colonial sub subject, subjectation, subjectation, sorry, <laughs> of indigenous cultural objects and the formation of Western narration of indigenous people's art forms. I will examine the role that museums have in relationship to indigenous peoples and how through indigenous resurgence and relationality frameworks, the museums can be sites for indigenous resurgence. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you. Hi Cho, Masi Cho. Hi, sorry everyone. Uh, I hope you can. I hope you can see me. We had a little uh, technical glitch there. We have to switch hosts for the recording purposes. Okay, good. People can see me. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elaine, for that presentation. That was fantastic. Uh, we move. We move next to Amanda Evans. Uh, oh, sorry. I forgot to say. If people have questions for Elaine, uh, you can send them. You should be able to send them to me now in the chat. 
uh, as a private message. Uh, and if not, you can send them to the host, whoever is marked as the host, but you should be able to send them to me. Uh, and after all four presentations, you will again have an opportunity to send your questions uh, and we will address them then. So we turn now to Amanda Evans. Amanda is a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta and a first year PhD student in the Faculty of Native Studies. She did a Master of Arts degree in the Department of Sociology at the U of A and a BA in Sociology at Dalhousie University. Her research interests include Métis work, labor, and connections to land. The title of her presentation is Ecological Habitus, Métis Expressions of Identity and Place in Oil Sands Work. So we will turn it over to you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. You can see that all right, Nancy? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so as Nancy said, the title of my presentation is Ecological Habitus, Métis Expressions of Identity and Place in Oil Sands Work. Oil extraction in Canada is expected to increase from 4.59 million barrels per day in 2018 to 5.86 million barrels per day by the year 2035. This is the figure that is stated in the latest report from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Even with the downturn of oil prices, there's still optimism built into this report where they say there will be more pipelines to the sea and Keystone is an inevitability. Increasing production will further contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, and subsequent climate change, along with other environmental concerns. In this report, there's also a page on Indigenous involvement in oil sands projects, highlighting revenue, procurement, community investments, consultation, and an overall reporting that 6% of oil and gas workforce is Indigenous. While the tone of this, pa of, of this page on this report seems positive, I wonder about the true benefits to Indigenous communities through these endeavours. While production of oil and gas is driven by modern industrial lifestyles and international demand for petroleum products, this activity occurs on the homeland of Indigenous people, including the Métis who participate in this industry. As a Métis woman myself with family members who work in oil sands and industries that support oil and gas work, I know that employment here has a lot to do with supporting and providing for family and getting the family ahead and living a good life. This project is actually an extension of my master's work where I talk to oil sands mine workers about their work and environmental issues. I took several trips to this to visit this area around the mines. <clears throat> they used to do tours in the Suncor mine but shut them down in 2015 right when public publicity was getting bad for them and the downturn of oil prices happened. So I found a company at the airport that did air tours for so young pilots can get more airtime. So I paid this guy 250 bucks to fly me over the mines and that's where this picture comes from. But it also symbolizes for me the displacement of indigenous lands of sorry displacement from indigenous lands. It makes me wonder who used to live here and who still does. Addressing the human causes of climate change from other and other forms of environmental degradation necessarily requires that we alter our social practices. Central to such social, social change includes understanding how individual environmental attitudes and behaviors align with pro-environmental behavior change. To understand how Métis oil and gas workers position themselves towards this extraction industry and the relational and cultural connections they have with place and land must also be understood. Margaret Kovach tells us that place is what differentiates us from settler societies, including both privileged and marginalized groups. Place gives us identity, place links present 
with the past and our personal self with kinship groups. What we know flows through us, the echo of generations and our knowledges cannot be universalized because they arrive from our experiences with our places. So like most academic projects, this started with a literature review for me looking into different theories surrounding environmental social movements. This next part is a bit of a genealogy of, um, of some of these thoughts. Old social psychological models explain that social change is a product of a person's belief, values, and attitudes. Likewise, behavioral psychologists note that environmental attitudes don't always align with behavior, such, as, such that a person professing value for the environment doesn't necessarily behave in pro-environmental ways. Over time, this became known as the environment behavior gap. <clears throat> Much research has going, gone into exploring this gap. In an attempt to identify all the social and personal factors that prevent people from behaving according to their values. This is my favorite model. Uh, it is a result of a literature review on different behavior uh, gap models and mashes them all up into this. This is a mixture of internal and external factors and barriers that block pro-environmental behavior. I don't know if anyone's used this in a study, but it, there are some issues with these models. Uh, apologize for the fuzziness of this, but you can get a sense uh, from this model that it, it emphasizes um, mainly individual uh, behaviors. Besides the mention of political, social, and cultural factors, there's no place in this model for kinship relationships. Another issue with these models is that analysis of the results often present attitudes and behaviors as simplistic and static. This has the effect of homogenizing diverse groups of people and stereotyping environmentally concerned citizens. These generalizations leave little room for understanding how indigenous people voice their concerns for, ind for industrial climate change, pollution of waterways and oil sands work. Along with this, Indigenous people are often portrayed in media as antagonists to oil and gas production. Earlier this year, Wet'suwet'en resistance to a liquid natural gas pipeline was national news. However, sometimes Indigenous communities are reported as being pro-development and even challenging those who oppose oil sands expansion. Earlier this year, a mega mine that was ready to open up, on, up north of Fort McMurray, the frontier mine, was supposed to have a footprint as large as the corporate boundary of Edmonton. The 14 Indigenous groups around that area all agreed to the mine, but Indigenous communities downstream of the project were united in opposing it. <clears throat> tech Resources shelved the project on February 23rd of this year in a letter from, the tech, from tech president Don Lindsay to Jonathan Wilkinson, Canada's Minister for Environment and Climate Change writes, Global capital markets are changing rapidly and investors and customers are increasingly looking for jurisdictions to have framework in place that reconciles resource development and climate change in order to produce the cleanest possible products. This does not yet exist here today and it is now evident there is no constructive path forward for this project. Questions about societal implications of energy development climate change, Indigenous rights are critically important ones for Canada, its provinces, and Indigenous governments to work through. Within this complexity and struggle for power and self-determination are individuals who participate in this industry as a means for a living in rural areas where there are not many employment alternatives. Another approach to explore the connections between persons' labour and relationships with the land is through ecological habitus and indigenous methodologies. <clears throat> ecological habitus can be seen as a form of social practice theory that relies heavily on the theories of Bourdieu. In Bourdieu's theory, habitus is seen in relation to a social field 
Habitus generates practices where actors are reworkers of the raw materials yielded to us by history and experience. It can be understood as a feel for the game, practices of living socially and ecologically well in a particular place. Essentially, ecological habitus generates practices appropriate for social ecological characteristics of a specific place. Discovering ecological habitus re requires defining what an ecologically sound practice looks like, a critique of the social structures that inhibit an ecologically sound lifestyle, and discovering how social relations resist an ecological worldview and lifestyle. In a study on ecological habitus and cognitive practices of environmentally active people involved with environmental organizations in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Randolph Halusa DeLay concludes that environmental organizations can be seen as a field where ecologic, ecological habitus, quote, can be shaped supported and maintained in opposition to unecological logic of practice of our contemporary society, end quote. Within his study, Halusa DeLay writes about there being two habitus, an ecological or environmental one opposed to and is opposed to a dominant habitus. The awareness of inconsistency that environmentally active people have where they are not living ecological lifestyles, the ecological lifestyles they want to live for him demonstrates how an environmental habitus brushes up against dominant habitus and practices. In contrast to the idea of two conflicting habituses, Debbie Casper sees ecological habitus as, a singular, as singular and value neutral, where dispositions fall on a continuum of pro-ecological to anti-ecological. She conceptualizes ecological habitus as a web of dispositions that include dimensions of living ecologically well that include habitat, water, food, energy, waste, life activities, economic behavior, identity behaviors, and future goals. Although these dispositions are considered to be long lasting, changes occur when actors encounter new experiences or the field that they act upon changes. In short, for Casper, every group has an ecological habitus, but it's not necessarily a pro-environment relationship. To better express Métis uh, experiences, sorry, to better represent Métis experiences working in the oil industry in Canada, I will employ Indigenous storytelling and oral history methodologies that embody respect, responsibility, reciprocity, and interrelatedness. Storytelling through personal narratives about place, happenings, and experiences teach about the consequences, good and bad, about living life in a certain way. Margaret Kovach describes how stories and conversation are an honored form of knowledge sharing. She says, quote, conversation is a non-structured method of gathering knowledge. While this seems like another way of saying interview, the term interview does not fully capture, capture the full essence of this approach, end quote. Godet 2019 quotes Métis elder Maria Campbell as saying, quote, Wakotoin meant honoring and respecting these relationships. Human to human, human to plant, human to animals, to water, and especially to the earth, end quote. She goes on to describe Kiyokewin, the visiting way, in particular as a method that brings us back to the relational obligation and responsibility in connection with our relations, both human and non-human. Kiyokewin holds great promise as it aspires to bring all pieces back together and lead us back to what is right. It is a relational obligation and a spiritual responsibility. My research will use ecological habitus to inquire about the environmental attitudes and behavior of Métis oil workers. This population is often not asked about how their employment and oil extraction connects to the relationships to the land, but we are understood to have a long relationship with the land 
and are thought to be at odds with oil extraction activity. To meet this objective, my research question is, how does a sense of place, social position, affect Métis persons, environmental concerns and behaviors toward the land? Guiding questions to meet this research objective include, how are environmental issues, particularly climate change, viewed, understood and experienced by Métis people working in oil sands projects of Northern Alberta? And how does ecological habitus and a sense of place influence a Métis person's relationship with the land? For this research, I will undertake three, a three-phase approach. In phase one, I will meet with key community connections at the Métis Nation of Alberta and Rupert's Land Institute to discuss a community-engaged research that reciprocally benefits the people of the Métis Nation. Phase two will be to connect with Métis community members who currently work for oil and gas industry. In this phase, I will build relationships with 15 to 20 individuals through visiting in order to understand their work land connections through conversations that focus on their personal stories and oral histories of working in oil industry. Phase three of this research entails giving back to community. Drawing on my experience working with the Rupert Science Center for Métis Research, I intend to give back to the community through developing a report and organizing community presentation events to facilitate discussion around the results of this research. <clears throat> this research is about exploring the gap that exists between Indigenous ways of knowing and being and participating in extractive industries. As a Métis woman who is a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta and currently lives in Alberta, I'm situated to undertake this research. Having family members who work in resource extraction, I consider myself an insider to this community. The results of the study will contribute to understanding the complexity of how Métis oil industry workers understand and view the relationship with the land and the tensions that arise from contributing to a petroleum economy. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. That was fantastic. Such important work. Uh, so next we have Leah Hertzun who is a first year PhD student in Indigenous Studies. She is a settler of Ukrainian, German, and Jewish ancestry on Treaty 6 territory in the Métis homeland. Her research interests include Indigenous histories, repatriation, material culture, settler Indigenous relations, and critical whiteness studies. And the title of her presentation for today is The Stories of These Lands, The Potential of Recovering Indigenous Ukrainian Narratives in East Central Alberta. So I'll turn it over to you, Leah. Great, thank you very much, Nancy. I will go ahead and share my presentation here. Um, is that the proper view? No. Try this again. And what about now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Perfect, wonderful. Well, thank you very much everyone for attending today. Um, as Nancy said, my name is Leah Hertzun and I am a, uh, a first year PhD student in the Faculty of Native Studies. I am a settler who has lived most of their life here in Amiskwichi, Wiskahigan on Treaty 6 territory and the Métis homeland. My mother's family began arriving in Canada on German passports in 1927. And my father's family began arriving in 1909 as Ukrainian speaking immigrants from what was then Austria. I strongly identify with my Ukrainian heritage, mostly because of the influence of this woman pictured here, uh, Eva Hertzun, um, my paternal grandmother, or uh, my Baba, as I call her. Um, my Ukrainian ancestors settled in East Central Alberta, very near to Wasetna and the Victoria Settlement, where Métis, cult Mé where Métis Crossing Cultural Centre is currently located. In recent years, my Baba, who is now 91, 
has become a lot more open about sharing stories of her past. And I have been asking her questions about interactions um, she had or stories that she knew about Ukrainian and Indigenous people. I always get the same response from her. There were no natives here. Unsatisfied, I began searching for stories of Indigenous Ukrainian relations with very limited results. Surely there had to be some stories of interactions between people who lived on the same lands. It turns out historians of early Ukrainian settlement in East Central Alberta have told and retold a scant few, most of which involve some type of rescue in unforgiving lands. Here is one of the most renowned. In November, 1899, the Urichucks left Edmonton for their new homestead near Smoky Lake via the North Saskatchewan River. It was much colder than they could have imagined and their raft became stuck on a sandbar and was quickly surrounded by ice. Nearly frozen and desperate for help, an Indigenous family came to their rescue and saved them from certain death. I was discouraged by the lack of stories and I put my research on hold, hoping one day to come back to it. Recently, while I was attending a conference, a woman who was sitting next to me after struggling to pronounce my name as many do, she casually mentioned that her late great-grandfather spoke Cree and Ukrainian, but never learned English. Sadly, she knew nothing about the backstory as to why he spoke Ukrainian, but my interest was piqued. Then, while conducting my MA research, a community-based project with Métis in Alberta, participants began sharing their stories of Indigenous Ukrainian relations in East Central Alberta. I had to ask myself, why was I and my fellow Ukrainian folk completely ignorant of these stories? What had happened to the stories of my ancestors to allow them to erase the presence of Indigenous people? The story of the Urichucks and their harrowing rescue by Indigenous people from the icy grips of the North Saskatchewan River is typical of early Ukrainian settlers who encountered Indigenous people when they began arriving in East Central Alberta in 1891. Ukrainian settlers told stories of the kindness they experienced from Indigenous people and expressed sympathy that they too faced severe discrimination from white Canadian society. However, as Canada's acknowledgement grew of the quote unquote essential role of Ukrainians in settling the prairies, Discrimination against them waned, and by the 1970s, they, became, they came to be fully accepted as part of white Canadian society. The colonial processes that legitimized this trans transformation also shaped a mythology grounded in the hardships faced by early settlers in harsh, empty landscapes, the consequence of which erased Indigenous people from their histories. Ukrainians came to see themselves as the first true occupants of these lands. These revisionist histories are the stories of my ancestors. So that said, my research seeks to uncover narratives of Indigenous Ukrainian relations in East Central Alberta and bring Indigenous people and Ukrainian Canadians together to open dialogues surrounding their shared histories. I will demonstrate that recovering these histories and deconstructing how and why Ukrainian settlers came to support settler colonialism redress Indigenous erasure in Ukrainian settler histories. The erasure of Indigenous people from settler narratives is sadly all too common. As John Monroe discusses is in his 2014 article, Historical accounts of Indigenous settler interactions often have consigned Indigenous people to minor supporting roles in the advancement of the settler colonial project. Indeed, while the past 20 years had, has witnessed an infusion of scholarship focused on Indigenous histories from scholars such as Natalie Kermowal, Mary Jane McCollum, James Daschuk, Sarah Carter, and Patricia McCormick, 
and scholarship on settler colonialism from scholars such as Eric Chalmers, Amy Carrillo Rowe, and Eve Tuck, Marlene Epp, Franca Ikaoveta, and Zoe Laidlaw, and Alan Lester. Only a handful of these scholars are focusing on the internal complexity and the dynamics of Indigenous settler relationships. This scholarship has highlighted the need to uncover stories of Indigenous settler relations through the centering of Indigenous voices and conduct ethnic settler specific research to deconstruct settler colonialism in Canada. Scholars argue that without recognizing shared histories and the ramifications of Indigenous erasure, settlers cannot move toward being in good relation with Indigenous people. A large body of literature exists on Ukrainian social, political, and cultural history by scholars such as Orest Martinovich, Rhonda Hinter, John Lair, William Sumer, Helen Potrobenko, and Francis Swaripa and Myrna Kostash, who have focused on Ukrainian identity in Canada. However, scholars have largely ignored Ukrainian Indigenous relations. Recent social and geographical histories of Ukrainian settlers in East Central Alberta and in Saskatchewan make little to no mention of Indigenous people. And while they focus on how Ukrainians made homes on these lands, do not acknowledge the dispossession of Indigenous peoples through Ukrainian settlement. Well, historian Myrna Kostash, who I believe is here today, thank you very much for attending, um, has begun the very important work of questioning Indigenous erasure in Ukrainian settler narratives uh, during her public presentations to both the Ukrainian Canadian and Indigenous communities. Much of her work remains unpublished in scholarly articles. Consequently, there is a gap in scholarly literature. To begin filling this gap, the narratives of Indigenous Ukrainian relationships in East Central Alberta must be recovered. This will allow for a richer analysis of the role Ukrainian Canadians play in the colonial project of Canada. As I mentioned earlier, uh, while conducting my MA research, I began hearing stories of Indigenous Ukrainian relations in East Central Alberta. These stories were not the stories of my ancestors, despite being conceived on the same lands. It was made clear to me that I was not alone in my ignorance. And in fact, those I was conducting research with spoke of the need to see the narratives of Indigenous and Ukrainian histories of East Central Alberta uncovered as an act of self-determination. Moreover, they expressed a desire for me to educate Ukrainian Canadians on the role we play in furthering the colonial project of Canada. This, they stated, was of the utmost importance in order to bring Ukrainian Canadians and Indigenous people toward being in good relation with one another. Further, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action number 63 calls for building student capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy, and mutual respect. Capacity that will be built through this research and its dissemination. As a Ukrainian Canadian experienced in conducting historical and Indigenous community-based research, I believe I am the ideal person to undertake this critical research. My research will address the following questions. First, what are the stories of Indigenous and Ukrainian settler relationships in East Central Alberta? Second, how have the politics of the colonial project of Canada concealed narratives of Indigenous Ukrainian relationships in order to bring Ukrainian Canadians into white Canadian society. Finally, how can opening dialogues surrounding shared histories place Indigenous people and Ukrainian Canadians in good relation? This research will focus primarily on the geographic area of East Central Alberta, encompassing historic, encompassing historic and contemporary lands of First Nations 
and Métis, as well as the sites of the first Ukrainian settlement in Canada. Um, it will also cover the temporal period from 1891, when Ukrainian settlers began arriving, to the present. First, uh, to answer my research questions, I will begin with archival research to recover the narratives of Indigenous Ukrainian relations. I will also conduct in-person interviews with approximately 20 to 30 individuals who are First Nations, Métis, or Ukrainian Canadian who reside in or have a connection to East Central Alberta to recover the stories of their relations. Second, I will analyze the narratives and demonstrate how settler colonialism has erased Indigenous, Ukrainian Indigenous shared histories. I will also deconstruct the narratives of Ukrainian Canadians who remain committed, whether consciously or unconsciously, to the erasure of Indigenous people from their narratives. Third, I will bring the research participants together in a series of in-person or virtual workshops to present the narratives and findings. Together, we will analyze the findings to expose how recovering narratives of Indigenous Ukrainian relations challenges the erasure of Indigenous people on these lands. It is anticipated that opening dialogues will reveal ways in which Ukrainian Canadians and Indigenous people can create a better relationship for the future. Fourth, utilizing my experience in exhibition creation, the research participants and I will co-create a traveling exhibition featuring our shared histories. This will provide a forum to mobilize the knowledge created through this research and make physical space for Indigenous people and Ukrainian Canadians to come together to be in good relation. The first objective of my research involves rereading the archives, a colonial practice that transforms colonial archives into sites of resistance by reading them against their grains. This will allow me to recover the archival accounts of Indigenous Ukrainian relations. This phase of my research also involves Kyukewin, an Indigenous research methodology um, that we heard about from Amanda as well, um, that uses visiting as research. Visiting as research focuses on the relationality, the reciprocity, and the respect that is necessary in Indigenous research. My second objective will focus on analyzing the archival and participant narratives, incorporating theories of critical whiteness by Indigenous studies scholars, such as Eileen Morton Robinson, Glenn Coulthard, Daryl LeBrew, Chris Anderson, and Kehulani Kauani to expose how Indigenous people are erased from these lands and deconstruct the narratives sorry, the narratives that keep Ukrainian Canadians committed to their revisionist histories. This will allow me to expand current theories of whiteness and settler colonialism that have thus far focused on English, French, Nordic, Mennonite, and Dukabor settlement on the Canadian, per on the Canadian prairies, and will allow me to develop theories of critical whiteness that seek to explain and deconstruct the Ukrainian Canadian specific commitment to upholding settler supremacy and Indigenous erasure. Critical whiteness studies play an important role in the discipline of Indigenous studies because it exposes the invisible structures of whiteness that continue to dispossess Indigenous people. Indigenous studies scholars have critiqued the ways in which settler colonial studies have been co-opted by white scholars in an attempt to address settler guilt. Indeed, many question the motives of white scholars who have reframed settler colonial studies in ways that erase its Indigenous origins and seek to highlight the narratives that immigrants were victims of colonization too. These 
these revisioned settler colonial studies frameworks continue to uphold settler supremacy and do little to demonstrate how and why indigenous erasure and dispossession has occurred. Framing this research in critical whiteness studies as theorized by indigenous studies scholars will allow for a more complete analysis of Ukrainian Canadian settler colonialism that pushes back against indigenous erasure. Finally, the third and fourth objectives of my research will return to Keokewin as I perform the relationality and reciprocity required of me as a researcher. The workshops that I am planning and the exhibition that I will be creating will create space that navigate away from Indigenous erasure. They will also educate Ukrainian Canadians as well as the public at large of the shared histories of Ukrainian Canadians and Indigenous people in East Central Alberta. It is my hope that by recovering these histories and deconstructing how and why Ukrainian settlers came to support settler colonial supremacy, redress Indigenous erasure in Ukrainian settler histories and build capacity to bring Ukrainian Canadian and Indigenous people into good relation with one another. So I thank you all very much. Um, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much, Leah. Oh, wow, the citations just popped up. That was impressive. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks again. Um, before we move to our last presenter, I just wanted to remind audience members uh, that if you have questions for any of the presenters, uh, please message me, Nancy Van Stuyvendil, uh, privately in the chat. And then after our next presenter presents, we will have uh, a Q&A session. So, so please do send those questions along. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have Wyatt Schiefelbein, uh, who is Métis uh, and is a first year PhD student in the Faculty of Native Studies. His research interests include examining the ways in which anti-Indigenous ableism functions within Canada and more specifically Alberta to marginalize Indigenous peoples. The codependency of discourses of racism and ableism in psychological constructions of, in, of indigeneity constituted a focus of his master's research, which he intends to expand on in his doctoral research. The title of his presentation today is The Analytics and Interventions of slash in Indigenous Albertan Disability. So Wyatt, we will turn it over to you. Wyatt, are you okay? Hi, sorry, I had a problem unmuting myself. Can you hear oh, me now? Yeah, I can, uh, but I've lost your screen. That's okay. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Okay, let's try this. How is that the right screen? Yep. And you can hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. Danse Kiwa, Dada Nast Ada. Hello everyone, my name is Wyatt and I'm a Métis and non-status Tatsina man from Calgary. <clears throat> I'm currently in my first year of the PhD program at FNS. Um, and I, my research interests include um, disability and indigeneity. Uh, when I was nine or 10, I was diagnosed with a learning disability and that really um, sort of began my interest in this research topic. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, my research so far largely pertains to the field of Indigenous Critical Disability Studies or ICDS for short, where I attempt to better understand the ways in which settler colonialism dispossesses Indigenous peoples of lands and bodies through ableist discourses of Indigenous inferiority. Um, I use the word indigeneity to refer to the knowledges which are produced by settlers regarding Indigenous people and that play an integral role to processes of settler colonialism. Um, I think as of yet in Indigenous studies, we do a really good job of engaging with the ways that indigeneity is um, understood as both a racialized and gendered knowledge, uh, but we haven't so 
really engaged with indigeneity as being a disabled knowledge as well. So some questions which my research asks is how do indigenous peoples come to be understood through disability? And how does ableism function to dispossess indigenous peoples from lands and bodies, particularly with an eye to Alberta? Um, so <clears throat> I use Fiona Campbell's articulation of ableism as being a belief that impairment or disability, irrespective of type, is inherently negative and should the opportunity present itself be ameliorated, cured, or indeed eliminated. <clears throat> I'm especially interested in the ways that learning disability or LD, um, given its, its particular characteristics and relationships to things like intelligence, um, can illuminate the ways in which ableism it functions to dispossess indigenous people of our land of bodies. When we're discussing learning disability, I think we're really discussing uh, what I call psychoeducational resources. Uh, so these include things like funding um, or extra funding for materials and things like computers, um, but also extra time for tests or teaching aids that could, for example, read questions aloud to students who have troubles reading. Um, and I think too, we could talk about stigma or the ways that people react to um, diagnosed or undiagnosed disabilities in community as a, a kind of resource as well. Uh, so this is more of an anecdotal um, representation of how one would access these resources. Um, so at first we start off with a referral. So when you're a youth, this would usually come from like a teacher or a parent, um, perhaps a doctor. With, as adults, referrals uh, can also come from doctors, um, but we can also start to advocate for ourselves more. Um, and these can lead to assessments. Um, in Alberta, these assessments are given through private practitioners or private schools. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. Um, and assessments can lead to a diagnosis of learning disability. Uh, the nature of learning disability is a very uh, contested issue. And so this assessment um, will depend on the interpretation of learning disability of the institution that someone goes through to get this diagnosis. Then uh, presumably these diagnoses, if one is diagnosed with a learning disability, will increase uh, access to the psychoeducational resources I mentioned. Um, but in reality, one's access to these resources are mediated by socio-political, geographic, and economic contexts. Um, so opportunities to acquire a diagnosis for LD to get resources, however problematic they may be, is limited in both urban and indigenous communities, particularly in the years following the United Conservative Party's aggressive attacks on public schooling. While psychoeducational assessments were made available to students within Albertan public school system, generally, uh, recent funding changes and firing practices of the Albertan government under the UCP has meant that many public schools can no longer offer these assessments or services um, provided by school psychologists. Instead, parents now have to pay private practitioners for these extremely costly assessments or for private schooling where such resources and supports are still available. So in Alberta, uh, a psychoeducational assessment can cost anywhere from about $1,500 to $3,000 just for the assessment. Um, and anecdotally, anyway, um, there is a news article uh, that I was reading about how someone put their kid in a private preschool and how that cost $200 a month to do, um, but they were able to access the resources they needed. Um, so I think that these sort of um, expenses will negatively impact Indigenous peoples, um, particularly for two reasons. The first is expense. Um, as I mentioned, these are very high costs for psychoeducational assessments, but at the same time too, um, indigenous youth experience poverty to greater degrees than do non-indigenous youth. Um, so the stats for that are about 35 to 40% of indigenous youth experience poverty as opposed to 18 to 19% of all children in Canada. Um, so we, ha we have uh, inacc inaccessibility of these assessments due to expense. Um, but another reason is for location. And so um, in rural Alberta, psycho psychological practitioners are not often readily accessible. 
this map was something that I did in my master's research, sort of an exploratory analysis of the geographic distribution of psychologists who can give a psychoeducational assessment. Um, so each of these points represents a different psychologist advertising on psychologytoday.com. Um, of 120 psychologists who explicitly mentioned that they could give a psychoeducational assessment, three operate outside of Edmonton, Calgary, or the spaces in between. Um, the little uh, point that kind of covers up the word Alberta, um, those two points there are actually just one person who works in two non-Indigenous communities. Um, and so this was as of June 2020. Um, to kind of give a sense of what I'm talking about here, these blue um, marks are uh, different First Nations reserves and Métis settlements um, in Alberta. And we can see that there is um, a, a large number of them who are not anywhere near uh, psychoeducational um, assessment opportunity. Um, so th this gives a problem because a lot of Indigenous folks won't be able to access a psychoeducational assessment. Um, so in an attempt to discuss what an analysis or the impacts of an undiagnosed LD uh, Indigenous Albertan communities might include, it's important to note that in 2007, the study putting a Canadian face on learning disabilities found that in Canada, when compared to their able peers, children and youth with an LD had lower perceptions of their self-worth and capacity to undertake and complete tasks. And then as adults, people with LD were found to experience increased instances of depression, suicidal thoughts, and stress. Uh, the same study concluded that the reason for these negative outcomes of uh, LD, particularly undiagnosed, is largely uh, economic marginalization. Um, the same study found that people with LD were both more likely to be unemployed than their able peers and earn less money when employed. Statistics Canada explains that this level of increased unemployment and economic marginalization um, is the direct result of lower educational achievements and training opportunities and increased labor force discouragement among folks with an LD. Um, as Stegman argues, part of these negative experiences of people with LD may be the result of the fact that about a third of families with an LD child or youth report not being able to afford the services and interventions that their child or youth require. Indeed, raising a child or youth with an LD in Canada may increase the burden of poverty uh, on the family over the lifetime, as it costs more to put a child in special education than it does to not. Uh, further, the cost for an individual over a lifetime with LD was uh, estimated to be about $445,000. Um, likewise, Statistics Canada reports uh, in 2014 an $11,600 $11, discrepancy in median yearly earnings between those with LD and those without to the detriment of the former. Um, at that time, only 28% of adults with an LD were employed uh, as opposed to 73.6% of adults who did not have an LD. Um, given the nature of barriers to assessment that I've mentioned already, uh, that of expense and location, plus the recent changes to assessment availability in Alberta due to the UCP, we should expect that it, Indigenous peoples will bear the brunt of these issues. However, it's also important to note that beyond expense and location, there's also an issue of um, learning disability as uh, a knowledge and how that relates to indigeneity. By not disaggregating these statistics that I mentioned above to account for indigeneity, LD studies presents these statistics as being equally felt among all demographics, which is very much uh, seems not to be the case. For my dissertation, I want to engage with this erasure of the experiences of Indigenous people with LD, and in so doing, show how this construct enables marginalizing interventions in Indigenous lives. In another sense, I want to better present how it is that ableist knowledges of Indigenous peoples through psychoeducational framings of indigeneity function within Alberta to marginalize Indigenous peoples. For example, we should consider that while psychoeducational assessments can increase positive outcomes for LD individuals through enabling their access to resources, Indigenous peoples may very well be under referred for assessment as their performance in school is assumed to be low as a racialized, gendered, ableist a priori. In my master's research, I began to develop a theoretical lens and methodological approach to address these kinds of questions 
that I called ICDS. Um, for my work in ICDS, I relied on Amy Morton Robinson, Brendan Hokapitu, Elizabeth Popinelli, and Anima et al. Um, but unlike other disability studies approaches, ICDS does not take categories of disability and impairment lightly. Uh, instead, I seek to understand how the recognition and characterization of these terms functions to dispossess Indigenous peoples of our lands and bodies. As stated in my thesis, indigeneity must also be understood as a product of ableist discourses tied to the presumption of Indigenous peoples deficiencies in comparison to a weird or white educated industrial rich and democratic norm. The racialized and disabled Indigenous body then becomes a discursive means through which to justify the continued theft of lands and bodies of Indigenous peoples. While I focus on the ways in which ableist knowledges and racial knowledges conflate in psychological disciplines, in my dissertation research, I intend to extend this analysis to look at the ways in which gendered knowledges also function with ableist knowledges to further such dispossessions, and specifically how these operate in Alberta. Applying an Indigenous approach to CDS scholarship not only illuminates the ways in which discourses of ableism function to maintain settler colonial domination and possession of Indigenous bodies, but potentially provides a means of looking beyond the analytics of disability to better understand how settler colonial processes impact us. Um, as of yet, a major obstacle for my research is in balancing the need to attend to disability and impairment as uh, settler colonial epistemologies, um, while also maintaining a capacity to talk about the negative impacts of settler colonialism on Indigenous bodies. Um, as Mikosha 2011 asserts, processes of colonialism and imperialism are inherently disabling. Uh, in an attempt to think through this more, I identify two fields of knowledge production and their relationships as uh, the objects of my research. The first is that of psychoeducational institutions, and the second is of indigenous communities. Uh, with regards to the former, psychological knowledges, um, these are important to account for as they determine the nature of psychoeducational resources and who can access them and who can't. Um, there's two frameworks. Uh, that are important for my research that psychological knowledges take for granted. The first is that of disability and including impairment um, and sort of the two main models for how or the discipline of psychology understands these um, phenomenon is through what's called the medical model and the social model. Uh, the medical model says that disability is a medical problem in need of a medical solution and is inherently ableist in that sense. And the social model um, is quite a bit more complex and has a lot of different interpretations, but generally um, says that disability is uh, significantly impacted by um, society and our sort of societal expectations of what a body should be. A second framework of this kind of knowledge is uh, based in cultural difference. Um, and so particularly a distinction that gets made between Western culture and indigenous culture. Um, these frameworks uh, enable the kinds of claims as um, asserted by the Canadian Psychological Association and the Psychology Foundation of Canada, who in 2018 uh, claim that the application of psychological theories and assessments in indigenous communities caused harm because it was basically the um, the forced implication of Western cultural frames on indigenous peoples who didn't share uh, an understanding of disability in that same sense. Um, this brings me to my second field of knowledge production, which I'm interested in, namely that of indigenous communities in Alberta. I want to attend to the epistemologies and ontologies, the knowledges and realities of indigenous communities and people in Alberta, not purely because there are different engagements with the realities that we might elsewhere identify as disability, but because I see a possibility to create tangible change um, and increase access to psychoeducational resources. Um, as I discussed, the CPA and PFC are very critical of psychology's impact in Indigenous communities and actually call for psychologists to work with Indigenous peoples to create more culturally appropriate theories of uh, what we might call psychological phenomenon, um, including assessments. Uh, so my research wants um, to build capacity for this by creating a theory of um, learning disability in Indigenous communities 
that then can inform uh, community-based assessment practices that we can then advocate um, in order that they be seen as legitimate and increase access to psychoeducational resources in uh, Indigenous communities. Um, yeah. So some final thoughts around my dissertation research is um, that this, this kind of community-led assessment model that I'm theorizing about um, in a sense, sort of exists already in the Yukon, uh, though it's not necessarily for the same reasons as for what I present. Um, the little bit that I've been able to read by Bradford and Croker um, has talked about how communities in the Yukon generally are in charge of their own assessments and allocating uh, limited psychoeducational resources in the territory because there isn't that many psych um, educational psychologists who work there. Um, I, according to them, there are only four educational psychologists who work in the territory who are all um, working for the territorial government as opposed to the schools themselves. Um, also, those uh, there's no like real certification process for uh, educational psychologists, which Bradford and Croker um, are advocating for a more strenuous um, certification process. Um, also, I think we can think of learning disability as a discursive means of lifting up white students and not indigenous students. Um, as I mentioned, um, students who are already presumed to not do well in school, namely indigenous students through these, these racist knowledges, won't be referred as often as well white students who are expected to do well. So when they don't do well, that seems wrong. But when an indigenous student doesn't do well in school, that's almost expected, and so they won't be referred. Um, I want to look a little bit more into this um, and how, again, how racial and ableist knowledges conflate in uh, psychoeducational institutions. I think a really great example of how um, this sort of like racist and ableist discourse still permeates um, psychology to, uh, currently is Richard Lynn's 2006 book, which presumed to uh, talk about the um, average intelligence of every single racial group that Richard Lynn identifies. Um, hugely problematic, but for our purposes, if people were to take this seriously, um, Indigenous peoples would not, many Indigenous peoples would not actually qualify for a learning disability uh, diagnosis because they would have um, IQs that were too low. Um, so I think there's a, a big danger in taking these racialized and ableist knowledges to heart. Um, yeah, thank you all for listening to my presentation. These were just some ideas of what I'd like to do. Um, yeah, so here are my references. And yeah. Thanks, Wyatt. That was fantastic. Uh, so now we're going to move into question period. Uh, if